Uh, are you ready, Vanessa? Sorry, I can't. Oh, okay. Is it, can, you, can you hear me? Are we starting? Yes. Okay. There's a lot of noise in the background. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I think we can start. Okay. Okay, great. So I'd like to talk about causal estimates and interventions, which is partly a reflection on. Um, what we can learn from randomized trials when we do observational data analysis and the other way around what the observational data analysis might learn from randomized trials. Um, and, but also, uh, okay, so this is, this is the overview. And as I said, observational data analysis emulate randomized trials, clinical trials, on the other hand, start looking for help from causal inference. But really what I also want to talk about is uh, a new notion of S-demand, which is um, known as now as separable effects. And this is relevant to randomized trials with intercurrent events. Um, and, and when things happen after randomization, but before you measure the outcome, people often turn to causal mediation analysis. And this is where there might be an alternative in the separable effects. And um, in particular, I find the, the separable effects useful in a survival setting and especially in competing risk settings. So this is um, what in the end um, of the talk I want to focus on. Okay, but let's first, um, I have to do something first because there's a, I can see the chat and I don't want to see the chat. There you go, okay. There you go. Um, so uh, in epidemiology, Mostly, this is where, from where I come from, mostly we have observational data. And in order to focus the analysis better and to avoid lots of problems, it has become a good idea to um, use the target trial emulation approach to analyze observational data. So even if observational data is not from a randomized trial, it's good to think about what would be the ideal trial. And it also focuses on what is the decision problem that we want to address by analyzing these observational data. Um, it makes the intervention explicit because we have to formulate a trial uh, where we would carry out this intervention. So even though it's observational data, we have to be very clear about what the intervention is. And this um, has the advantages that we formulate a clear S demand. So what is it? that we want to estimate becomes very clear by taking this approach. And it also avoids the avoidable biases like immortal time bias or um, prevalent user biases, etc., that are common, especially when we analyze electronic health records. On the other hand, clinical trials, we, have, we typically have randomization. So what else do we want? We can randomize, uh, we can just look at uh, the outcome in the two groups, treatment and control group, um, everything's fine, no problem, wonderful. But no, things happen after randomization. And this, these have become known um, as a, by the summary term of intercurrent events. What might happen is people, especially when you study an older population, people might die before you can measure the outcome. They might not adhere to the treatment or they switch treatment or they have side effects, etc. All kinds of things happen. And these might either make, uh, make it impossible to measure the outcome, like when death occurs, or they give a new meaning maybe to treatment if people don't adhere to the treatment that was intended, for example. So also notice that this spoils the randomization because if you, you limit your analysis then to those who stay alive, then in this group, the treatment is not randomized anymore. You have a selection effect possibly. Uh, so people have um, started to ask, well, what is our S demand then, even if we have a randomization, if we have a trial, it's randomized, but what is our S demand then, what method should we use? And they turn to causal inference. And there's um, a guideline uh, of an international um, medicine agency um, that gives some guidance as to what, to what to do, or that people, when they design randomized trials, they should explicitly address how they want to deal with intercurrent events. And this is 
what's become known as the ICH E9 addendum. So in this context, I want to uh, basically contrast these approaches a little bit. So uh, when we have um, observational data and we uh, formulate a target trial, what we mean is that we think about what is the ideal intervention that reflects our research question. Um, what do we allow in our target trial? Because we can actually disregard certain practical, ethical, financial constraints. That is, in a way, what we really want, because within those constraints, we can conduct a randomized trial. But it's because we are interested in subpopulations that are maybe more frail, pregnant women or so, that are more difficult to study in an actual clinical trial, that we want to look at observational data in order to inform decisions also for these subpopulations. But we can do other things in our um, ideal trial, in our target trial, we can imagine we eliminate censoring, we enforce follow-up for everyone, um, and we might even enforce adherence uh, to the treatment for everyone uh, to some extent. But what is not allowed in our target trial, um, because we want it to be realistic, we want it to, you know, to reflect a possible a hypothetically possible trial, we don't want to violate the laws of physics. We don't want to turn back time. So things like individual causal effects uh, are not really something that can be uh, formulated in a target trial, nor want we, do we want to look into the future or even multiple parallel futures, which is something like um, what you would need to do to formulate a principal stratum effect. Uh, we might also want to stick to some ethical constraints and that we don't compare uh, treatments that we know or maybe the absence of treatment that we know would kill patients so they have no relevance in real life because it's not something that doctors would ever do. And we might also not want to force pa patients to stay alive because that is not possible. If we are studying an elderly population, some people are going to die. But some estimates are actually as if we are forcing patients to stay alive. I think someone called this the um, um, uh, zombie, zombie apocalypse scenario, this forcing patients to stay alive. On the other hand, randomized trials um, where uh, we have the randomization, but we might have intercurrent events. Intercurrent events where the outcome is still defined when people don't adhere to treatment or they switch treatment, et cetera then we still have the intention to treat analysis. It's still well defined and identified just by, based on the randomization. But what is the problem? Transferability might be hampered because it's of course valid for this type of population with this adherence um, uh, uh, behavior. And um, it's still a different interpretation than what we maybe originally wanted. So we are still thinking about what might be the S demand instead. Um, if the outcome is not defined, so um, if death occurs or if there are other requirements like people, you're studying people on dialysis, but then they get a transplant, then they don't belong to the group that we want to study anymore. Um, in this context, people have um, followed more the principal stratum type of approaches of, for example, looking at the always survivors. And as I would argue, this doesn't fit with the target trial approach. So remember, we have a trial, but there are intercurrent events. We switch to something we know from causal inference, which is principal stratum, but that then again, doesn't satisfy really the target trial uh, demands. Uh, should we use direct effect controlling for the mediator? Again, this would give us the zombie apocalypse, or um, do we formulate things via stochastic interventions, which might be another idea. So uh, what I want to talk about as an alternative are separable effects. Um, they formulate a different type of estimate demand, which in the context of competing events really leads to a completely new S demand. Um, th they are useful in some situations for randomized control trials, and they are also an alternative to causal mediation as demands in many other situations. I don't, I don't want to say that they are always uh, the solution uh, to everything, but in some situations, uh, they might be an interesting alternative. So let's have a look at the very basic example again to start with. We have a treatment, the treatment is randomized, so there's no confounding between treatment and whatever happens afterwards. 
but there's only partial compliance, perhaps but due to a side effect. So people loosely say the overall effect is reduced due to, due to the partial compliance because uh, people who are supposed to get the full dose of treatment don't get the full dose of treatment, so maybe they don't get the full effect. But it's not quite clear reduced to what. What are we comparing with? Um, just for the sake of exposition, I'm looking at a very simple case where also for the moment there is no confounding between um, adherence uh, and the outcome here. So what are possible S demands? Um, the, as I mentioned, one might be the controlled direct effect. Uh, the question is, is this a sensible target trial type quantity? Uh, are there situations where we might be interested in enforcing adherence, which is maybe sometimes possible, sometimes feasible, or at least thinkable? People can decide to definitely adhere to the treatment. But remember, we don't want to kill people if somehow adherence is not uh, sensible because it, it, uh, the, the patient would otherwise die, then it's not something that we want to adhere. We could modify this. There are other versions of this where it's not fully controlled in the sense of fixing the value, so enforcing adherence, but we have a, a stochastic intervention that still separates uh, adherence from the treatment. Uh, that is another version of this S demand. The alternative that I want to talk about is, uh, let's think about an additional modification of treatment. So not only is treatment randomized, but we might be able to somehow uh, modify to some other intervention in treatment that specifically targets the undesirable pathway. And as an example, that this isn't just theory or you know just just something where we can do in our imagination um, let's look at some um, uh, medical examples um, and i rely on the um, information from my medical collaborators here i'm not i don't have the medical background here but for example statins um, are supposed to the the intended uh, effect is to lower the ldl cholesterol but they somehow adversely affect the muscles and that uh, leads to bad adherence. People don't like this. But there's another type of drug, um, PCSK9 uh, inhibitors that also lower LDL cholesterol, but do not have these um, adverse effects on, on giving you some muscle pain. Um, so they, they have the same intended effect, but they get rid of the unintended effect. And this is uh, the uh, idea that leads to separable direct or indirect effects. So let's look at this formally. Formally, we have, uh, for the simplest case, binary treatment, uh, binary mediator, let's call it a mediator, this intercurrent event, good or bad adherence, and uh, for simplicity, a, a binary outcome, doesn't matter. What we assume with separable effects is that the treatment has separate components that can hypothetically be um, manipulated separately. So uh, think of um, a different ingredients, for example, the active ingredient is uh, responsible for the intended effect and maybe another ingredient that's responsible for the side effect. Um, so we would formulate our outcome, the potential outcome as a uh, a potential outcome under two settings now, where we uh, set the um, treatment component responsible for the desired outcome and the mediator component to possibly different things. And this might be a hypothetical new drug where we have changed the chemical composition of this new drug. So in this case, the separable direct effect would look like this. We, uh, we manipulate the first component, that's the desired drug effect, while we keep the second component at the level that avoids the side effect and therefore the bad adherence. Oops, let me go back. So this would be the separable direct effect. And um, it leads to, if we can think about things like this, it leads maybe to new drug developments. So actual uh, future um, hypothesis that can be tested in future trials where we can um, uh, investigate these sort of new drug effects here. 
It's helpful to look at this uh, with an extended uh, graph to represent also later the assumptions when I come to the assumptions. So in this extended graph, we have the original treatment and then we have the two treatment components. Observationally, with the situation as it is now, not a hypothetical future new drug, but now these are just identical. But our S demand would be formulated in terms of interventions on these two, a, the AM and the AY. So here AM activates the mediating pathway, AY activates the pathway that avoids the uh, mediator, the intercurrent event. And the hypothetical intervention is that we can set these to different values even though for the moment, maybe with a drug as it is, we can't do that yet. The target of inference um, as before might be, for example, the expected value of Y of the potential outcome Y on the settings of A, Y and A, M. If we manipulate this here, it's a direct effect. If we manipulate A, M, it's an indirect effect. Uh, and oops, let me go back again. So the original idea was uh, due to Thomas and Jamie. Uh, on this, and there's also more recent work where this is nicely described as what we want. So our target trial here would be a four-arm trial where we set this to the value zero and one and this to the value zero and one, so we have four arms. But the data that we have is this, it's a two-arm trial where we have only randomized the original version of A. So what about identification? Uh, first of all, we need to believe that what we do in our two-arm trial, this Y potential outcome YA, is the same as what we would do in a four-arm trial where both have the same value. So it's a sort, sort of consistency assumption. And then we need the separability assumptions where um, we need to make sure that the components are not informative respectively for the other quantities. So AY is not informative for the media Mediator, the intercurrent event given relevant information on the path and the other way around, AM is not informative for Y. And this has to hold in the forearm trial. Uh, so this is not something that holds observationally because observationally we do not have AY and AM. Uh, it has to hold in the forearm, hypothetical forearm trial. And then under these assumptions and some of the standard assumptions of causal inference, I'm not even talking much about confounding here, but let's just assume A was randomized. We uh, obtain the identifying function, uh, the known, well-known mediation G formula. And once we are back to this formula, we have many approaches available in the literature to estimate this. So it's um, basically, we're telling a different story for something that we already know, but the difference is to make us think about uh, the treatment um, and the actual interventions in our hypothetical trial in a different way. Um, now, to talk a bit more about the assumptions, I have so far assumed no confounding between mediator and uh, Y or between the intercurrent event, that's not realistic. A is what we can randomize, so this uh, is okay, but everything else might be confounded. Um, in this case, the assumptions say that uh, we, we need, we can, the separable effects are identified if we have data on C, but it would not be identified if we don't have data on C. So one of the assumptions would be violated. So the assumptions, uh, I didn't say this, the assumptions are basically absence of or, or these separations between A, M and Y and these separation between A, Y and M given suitable information. Now you may have noticed that I told you a story about uh, a side effect, but I haven't put the side effect in the graph. So uh, really a good practice is to put uh, your whole story into the graph. So the story might be like this um, with our separable treatment components, then there's a side effect, then there's the adherence, and then there's the outcome that we can measure. Uh, this is very restrictive because there are lots of edges uh, missing here. In reality, it might be that the side effect itself directly affects the outcome. In this case, again, we have um, a lack of uh, identification unless we also have data on the side effects. Or it might also be that the side effect is actually um, uh, due to the active ingredient that also does the intended um, effect. And then uh, we also have a lack of identifiability. So it's, uh, it's always good practice to put the whole story in the graph. Uh, 
Now, the problem really, if you think about it, occurs because these are things that happen over time. So there's randomization, then things happen, people decide, have developed side effects, develop whatever, switch the treatment, et cetera. And then at some later point in time, we measure the outcome. So really we should maybe look at things uh, via processes, uh, stochastic processes in a time dependent way. Also in many cases, survival or time to event uh, outcomes are, are what we look at in randomized trials. Um, so it turns out that many, the, the typical notions of direct and indirect effects become problematic in survival settings. But I'm not going to go into detail because I'm already running out of time a little bit. Uh, instead, we can take the separable effects approach. And um, I will here focus on competing event settings because here it really leads to a new S demand. So in competing events, we have, we might, for example, want to study the time uh, uh, so treatment for, for cancer, and we are measuring the death from that particular type of cancer, cancer, the duration, and death due to other causes is then a competing event. So we are measuring the time to the first of two events, and we make a note which one happens, is it death from cancer or death due to other causes? Uh, this can be represented more formally via counting processes. Um, we don't need much formalism here. Um, if we have a randomized treatment, randomization of A, then we can describe the total effects. There are in fact two effects, one for each event. The total effects are, uh, for example, in terms of the cumulative instance curves, uh, the probability that, the, um, uh, that the, the one event occurs and that this event is uh, of type K, that would be this um, um, event-specific cumulative incidence under treatment A or A star. That's a, that would be a contrast of these two curves would be a total effect. Uh, this, is, uh, this is identified without any further ado. We, have, we might have to deal with censoring if we have, and we assume independent censoring. Let's look at an example. Here, the uh, outcome of interest is death from prostate cancer and um, death from other causes might occur. Uh, we have a treatment, a new treatment called DES, and uh, it's a randomized trial with a placebo group uh, and a treatment group. And here we have all the four curves for the dotted ones for death from other causes, and the solid ones is death from prostate cancer over time. I think these are months, so the unit is missing. As you can see, the, um, from the dotted lines, the treatment increases the incidence throughout of death from other causes, whereas from the solid lines, you can see that the treatment decreases the incidence from death from prostate cancer throughout. These are total effects, overall effects. Now, we want people want to describe the effect on, of treatment on uh, death from prostate cancer alone not the total effect. Because what might happen, let me go back, what might, uh, an, one interpretation here is maybe treatment kills people from other causes and therefore we see fewer deaths from prostate cancer. Okay, so this is why people are usually not so happy necessarily with these um, S demands here. Oops. Um, so, uh, what is common in the literature, unfortunately, is to consider the competing event as a censoring event. But what does this mean? It means we are estimating um, something in a hypothetical setting where we eliminate the uh, competing event, which means eliminating death due to other reasons. And that's usually not a, a sensible estimate. This corresponds to the controlled direct effect or to maybe a halfway a zombie ap apocalypse because needed. There is a, um, a nice uh, paper also discussing this in the context of um, dementia research, um, uh, if you want to look at this. So let's look at separable effects instead. Um, we are going to imagine now that uh, treatment has two components, AY and AM. 
one that activates the pathway to the event of interest and one that activates the pathway through the competing event. Uh, and then we can uh, formulate the separable effects in terms of the uh, cumulative intensity uh, curve by saying, well, the direct effect is when we manipulate this component and the indirect effect is when we manipulate this component here. And this is in the context of competing events, a novel uh, S demand. Let's return to the example to illustrate this. this. Um, first of all, do we have separability? Do we believe in this assumption as a fundamental assumption? Is, is treatment even separable in principle, let alone is it then identified from the data we have? So is it, is it separable? And one medical hypothesis could be uh, where this treatment, it has a, a testosterone suppressing function to it, and it has another function to it, which has something to do with coagulation, which might in fact increase the risk of stroke. And if these can be separated, if you can find different um, ingredients, uh, chemical components to retain the testosterone suppressing without this uh, coagulation effect. And there is in fact a different drug, not DES, but uh, this drug that I can't pronounce, where um, this might be the case, so it has the coagulating effect, then um, that would uh, be a plausible hypothesis. And if we do the analysis with these data, um, looking at the same two events, again, event of interest, death from prostate cancer, uh, death from other causes is our competing event. And we now have green curve, which is the curve where we intervene to set AY to one and AM to zero. This means that the difference between the red and the green curve is the direct effect. And this is rather large. It's almost the same as the total effect. And the difference between the green and the red curve is the indirect effect, which is rather small. So in this case, under the assumptions that we have made, and there, they are strong assumptions, this would suggest that uh, the effect that we see is due to the direct effect of this testosterone suppression. Uh, the analysis was, however, um, assuming no time, uh, no post-treatment confounding, and that's unlikely when we have processes over time. Uh, we have generalized this uh, in this work here, and it makes things more complex complicated, but uh, it's still feasible, of course. Um, and there are various other generalizations also. Uh, this was basically on discrete time, assuming discrete time models. Uh, there's nice work from uh, Mats and Torben on continuous time, and also on the truncation by death problem, where you then also condition on um, uh, people remaining alive, which you can do in a certain, under certain assumptions when you look at separable effects. So to come to the end of my uh, talk, um, there are many challenges in choosing the right S demand. It's helpful to look at target trials, whether you really only have observational data or whether you are in a randomized trial situation, you might still want to think about a target trial. Um, and this has been discussed in the clinical trials literature uh, and also in, in guidelines um, here in this addendum, uh, for example. I don't want to suggest a one size fit all solutions. You always have to think carefully about the research question and estimate, but I think these separable effects really offer a new uh, point of view. Uh, they prompt the elaboration of interventions, specifically on treatment, which is something we might actually be able to change something about in form of drug development, for example. It's compatible with the target trial principle because it's a single world concept. And I know some of you care about these things. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, we're gonna have the questions during the panel session. And I think we can go to our second speaker, who is Georgia Papazogiorgu. Yeah.